Welcome to the Australian Water School, the home of demand-driven industry design training for the global water sector. Hello everyone and welcome. Thanks for joining us today for another informative and we hope thought-provoking Australian Water School webinar. Today's webinar is the second and final instalment of the series on applied hydrodynamic modelling. Some of you may have joined us for the previous instalment back in July. My name is Katrina O'Malley-Jones. I'm a principal engineer with BMT, specialising in coastal management, and I will be your chair for today's session. Today's presenters are Dr. Mitchell Baum and Dr. Zach Cooper, also from BMT. First up though, we'll have a quick look at where people are joining us from today. So we can see we've got a great spread of people from all around the world. It's, such, it's great to see such a large turnout today. And I think there's going to be some really valuable insights you'll be able to take away, regardless of whether your projects are coastal or riverine. Dr. Mitchell Baum is a coastal engineer specialising in numerical modelling. His experience spans a range of coastal projects, including sediment transport, water quality, and hydrodynamic oriented coastal projects. Mitchell's presentation today is a case study of modelling the Coorong, a shallow hypersaline estuary. Following Mitchell's presentation will be Dr. Zach Cooper, a coastal, civil and structural engineer. Zach's experience includes the design of a wide variety of coastal and riverine structures. He has also been involved in the modelling of complex biological structures such as the brain, which allows him to bring a very unique perspective to the hydraulic engineering space. Zach will present on three-dimensional hydrodynamic modelling in the Brisbane River to inform structural design. All right, well, without further ado, I'll hand over to Mitchell Baum to present on modelling of the Coorong. Thanks, Mitchell. Well, thanks, Katrina, and um, thanks for having me on the Australian Water School as part of our Applied Hydrodynamic Modelling Series. Um, my name's Mitchell Ball and I'm from BMT and I work as a coastal engineer here. And today we've got a particularly interesting case study of modelling of a hyper, shallow hypersaline um, estuary uh, where we'll be looking at the Coorong today. Um, so yeah, let's get stuck into it. We've done some pretty good model developments that I really want to showcase with you today. So it's, uh, it's going to be a really interesting one to get into. So today's presentation um, is going to be modeling centric, but the target audience is going to be appropriate for both modelers and non-modelers. And as I mentioned, we'll be looking at the case study of the Coorong, where we've got a shallow hypersaline estuary. And we'll be looking at today the, the developments we've done to help resolve the complex system dynamics. So they may involve the hypersalinity and mouth morphology and so on. We'll get just stuck into that soon. And um, finally, we'll go through some applications of the model um, and use of hydrodynamic models in um, de decision making for management of the Coorong. So the Coorong is uh, an asteroid system that's located um, for our international viewers in South Australia, um, to, towards the bottom of Australia here. And the Coorong is quite a unique asteroid feature where it's a, a long skinny estuary highlighted in white. Sorry, I just to get my pointer going. Um, where it's, um, yeah, so highlighted in white, we can see the Coorong here. And it's about 120 kilometres long um, with the widths ranging from about one to two kilometres typically and getting down to about 100 metres at one of the key hydrodynamic features um, at, at the Punka Narrows. We'll get into a bit more detail on that a little bit later. So the Coral is in, situated in quite a dry climate um, and the freshwater inflows are particularly important for the, the health um, of the, the, the Korong system. So these freshwater inflows come predominantly from the Murray River system. Uh, so we can see the Murray-Darling Basin on screen here. It quite, covers quite a large extent of the, the eastern seaboard of Australia. And it filters from Queensland through New South Wales and ultimately to the Murray River that we see on screen here. And it does so through uh, the, the Lakes Alexandrina and uh, Lake Albert, um, where we have inflows to the north of the Corong. Now these inflows make their way through a series of barrages that we see on screen here, these yellow inflow points. The barrages act as control points of flow um, from these with these freshwater inflows, which are going to be pretty important um, in, the, in managing, managing the flows uh, and the distributions through the Corong. 
And the, the fresh waters make their way or it's tidally connected to the Murray River mouth that we have on screen here. So it's, it's situated, all these hydrodynamic inflow points are really situated at the north of the model, which make it quite an interesting feature when we're looking at the dynamics, particularly in the southern end of, of the, the Karong here, which is separated by the Punka Narrows, which I mentioned before, it's about 100 metres wide and acts as a hydraulic control point. And the features here in, in the southern extent are quite extreme. We get really large salinity gradients um, in this, this region. And with the hydrodynamic and just the, the salinity behaviours we see here, we get quite a unique setup in terms of the, the biodiversity we see as a result. And here, the tidal fluctuations um, are really around the, the mouth of the, the Murray River. But uh, as we go down to the, the southern reaches of the, the Karong, the seasonal fluctuations really outweigh the, the tidal fluctuations here where we're getting a, a variations in the way of a metre um, in the, in the, uh, with highs in the winter and lows in the summer. So to start off the presentation, I'll give you a bit of a case study introduction uh, where we'll be looking at the significance and historical context of the surrounding the Karong. We'll be addressing the system complexities and the challenges that we have at hand here too. Um, we'll then move on to the key modeling questions and why we're using hydrodynamic models to, to investigate um, the, the processes in the Karong and management. And then for the bulk of this presentation, we'll be taking you through the, the model developments and applications that we have here. So the Karong, as mentioned, has got a complex um, a relationship between the freshwater estuarine and hypersaline water bodies. And with that, we have quite a unique habitat uh, for many local flora and fauna species and also migratory wading birds. And with this unique combination, um, it, the Karongs are recognised under the Ramsar Convention as a wetland of international importance. So with the, the Karong, uh, in Australia, to set some context, the millennium drought was pretty widespread. Um, and the Karong was no stranger to the impacts of the millennium drought, which lasted almost a decade. And what we could see is that we had major um, impact on the inflows from the Murray River. And as a result, Lakes Alexandrina and Albert reached their lowest point in about a thousand years. So the freshwater inflows into the Krong were basically stifled. And we also saw um, quite significant sedimentation around the Murray River mouth too. So without continuous dredging that, um, that took place across around the clock over the millennium drought, the Murray River mouth would have most certainly closed over. So with that, the water quality would have been significantly impacted. And even with these mitigation measures, the salinities in the South Lagoon um, were, went to quite extreme levels, uh, reaching over five times ocean salinity. And with these impacts, we saw a reduction of water level as well in combination with those really high salinities. And we saw quite significant impacts to the habitat and wildlife in the Karong. So with the, with the impacts in the millennium drought, the South Australian government committed quite a bit of funding to understanding how the model, or how the Karong behaves and its hydrodynamic behaviour. So with this, modelling has become a really valuable tool um, to understand these processes and how mitigation measures might be addressed and how we can look at managing the Karong moving into the future. So really the modelling questions arise on how the infrastructure might control um, the, the various water quality impacts through the Karong and how they may perform under different conditions, whether they be dry or wet conditions or even maybe to see um, climate change scenarios, which brings me on to my climate change impacts, um, looking at long-term assessments, how sea level rise might impact the, the health of the Karong and so on. And also looking at barrage inflows as well. Um, so they're, they're fresh water inflows to the north of the lagoon. Um, they're quite actively managed by the, um, the barrage uh, operators. So with the intent to try and direct fresh water inflows into the south lagoon under conditions more conducive to, to uh, the ingress of water or that fresh water inflows into, into that region of the lagoon. So with these modelling questions, uh, we also have some challenges that come, that come with the Karong. And it's quite a challenging system that we have morphological processes that need to be considered. Um, the hydrodynamics are also quite complex because we do have that um, interaction of estuarine freshwater and hypersaline water bodies. And then we have the hypersalinity, which also um, 
is a, a quite interesting feature to resolve in the South Lagoon and how we can actually get that that correct in the in, to the best of our ability in these models. And with this, the, the Karong also has large time scales at hand. So the South Lagoon in particular is prone to the, like seasonal um, or yearly um, time scales, but can um, the, the cadle as well too. So there's some big challenges we have here within modeling and um, it's something we've been able to uh, tackle with these hydrodynamic models too. So let's get into the importance of mouth morphology. And it's a quite an interesting feature with the, the Murray mouth and the dynamics that we have here. So here we have some aerial views of the Murray River mouth moving from left to right, um, increasing in time from 2009 to 2014. And we recall that in 2009 was the end of the millennium drought. So we do have quite a bit of sand accretion or sediment accretion on the inside of the, the Murray River mouth. And with the sand or sedimentation that we see here, that affects the movement of freshwater inflows and tidal inflows throughout the whole Karong system. So changes aren't just local, they also impact the South Lagoon, which is quite an area of interest. So as we can see, we've, we've got low, a case where we've got um, quite low flows, uh, particularly moving over the, the 10 years before, prior to this with the millennium drought. But in, in 2014, we've got a state where we've got um, much larger barrage inflows, which lead to erosion um, and outward um, fluxes of sediment in, out of the, the Murray River mouth. And we can see we've got a quite a, a large channel opening here on either side of the Murray River, uh, which affects the conveyance of flow. And then moving uh, even later to 2014, uh, we can see a bit of sediment build up again, um, particularly in the, the Gulwa Channel, um, moving just to, to the west or the north of the, um, the Murray River mouth that we see here. So there's quite a, what I'm trying to say, capture with this is that it's quite a dynamic process and something that needs to be considered in these hydrodynamic models. So if we were to look at mouth morph, uh, morphological um, processes in uh, hydrodynamic modeling, it can be quite a, uh, a cumbersome process or quite a, a challenging process to capture efficiently in that we've got bathymetry, that's the bed elevations at the Murray River mouth, uh, can be a function of the hydrodynamics and sediment transport. And we see this implemented in a closed feedback loop where the hydrodynamics move the sediments and sediment um, or the change to bathymetry as a result of that impacts the hydrodynamics. So, so there's quite a bit of feedback between these uh, these mechanisms. And if we're to resolve this in a, in a hydrodynamic model, it can take some time to resolve. So if we're interested in long-term impacts or looking at resolving various different um, uh, infrastructure options and so on, this process can be quite a slow mechanism um, to, to process in the hydrodynamic uh, models. So that's motivated us to look at a, an alternate way to, to consider the morphological processes. And that's taken us in the way of this new morphological update structure, which we've included into the two-flow FE code. So it's a really cool mechanism in that we can just use the bathymetry update in terms of a function of a temporal proxy. Now, the temporal proxy can be uh, one of three different types of implementation methods. So it could be something like a time series hindcast where we can use a database of bathymetry from a hindcast model, or we could use it as bathymetry survey directly taken for the Corong. Um, and then function that through time um, as, as some sort of function to, to update that database. We could also use a time series proxy. So that might be flow rate through a particular barrage. Um, so knowing a condition, what, what the river mouth might look like under a certain flow rate, we can assign that as a, a, as a database into the model. And more fundamentally, we could also use a flux sampling method. So we could take a transect across a particular channel and knowing what that flow might be, it could be assigned to a, a bathymetry database to assign that temporal proxy. So with that temporal proxy or that bathymetry database, we'll update the bathymetry, but also note that the change in bathymetry updates is a will be a function of these accretion and erosion response time scales. So accretion happens over a much longer time scale in orders of magnitude slower than the erosion time scale. So we've got that functionality added into, into this update structure, um, which we can manipulate in the FE code. 
And then moving on to the hydrodynamics following these bathymetry updates. So it's a lot more efficient to use this morphological update structure. Um, and it's, it's actually provided us some, a lot more flexibility in terms of long-term um, modeling scenarios uh, that I'll go through in a second. So if we're to look at application of the morphological update structure, um, here we have a time series of flow through to which we barrage. And just to give you a bit of reference, this is that's the yellow line that we see here. It's one of the major inflow points of uh, from the Murray River um, into the Corong. And so it's, and noting it's not like it's located quite close to the Murray River mouth as well. And here on in the colour map, we have a, um, a bird's eye view of the Murray River and the, the bed elevation that we see here. Uh, sorry, the Murray River mouth and the bed elevation we see. So if it play on this simulation, um, I'll just, hopefully that slides, yep. So we can see our time indicator here. As we move through, we're getting an increase in flow rate and we're seeing an increase in depth and widening of that, that mouth um, that we see here. And that affects the conveyance of flow through uh, of the freshwater flows through the mouth and also the tidal um, tidal uh, fluxes that we can see going into the model. And this really affects the water levels, um, particularly even further south into the South Lagoon. So here I have some time series that we uh, of the South Lagoon and the water levels. So on top, I have the static bathymetry case where we have, we don't, we've disabled this morphological structure. And in orange, we see the, the measured water levels in the South Lagoon. And in blue, we have the predicted water levels using the two flow FE model. And in the bottom case, we've enabled this dynamic bathymetry structure um, to what we have on the left of screen here with this animation. And what we can see, there was a flood event in 2011 and a smaller event in 2012. And with the static bathymetry, these increased flows actually um, resulted in a surplus in water level in the in the south lagoon because with the static bathymetry the mouth couldn't erode the water ends up driving um, into the south lagoon and we we're getting attenuation of that signal uh, of that water level in the south lagoon which is steering away from the 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 observ observations that we have here. Now with the dynamic bathymetry, we're seeing a much better model prediction uh, where we're seeing the dynamic bathymetry actually allow that conveyance of water flow through the, the river mouth. And we're getting water levels um, following these trends that we're seeing here from the, the observed water levels. Um, and this is a case of from, from 2010 to 2019. And we can see again, um, pretty good, um, prediction in water levels again in a smaller um, event here we have in 2016. So that brings me to um, looking at the different meshes that we might implement for this type of um, uh, this type of case study. So if we've got a different problem at hand, we may need to use a different mesh. And what I mean by a mesh is how we discretize the, the Karong into smaller sub segments or cells um, for, a, for those with a non-modeling background. So on the left-hand side, I have um, two different models. The top one being the detailed model. And this one's used for more detailed assessments, um, given the name of the detailed model. But cell sizes are a lot smaller in this case. And that's so we can resolve um, the, the finer features of the, the Karong um, and, and the hydrodynamic features we also have. It might be used for applications such as biogeochemical modeling, um, so in the whole water quality processes. And given its detail, these simulations really will be used for um, 10 year simulations. Um, and with this, uh, with a metric we use often using the hydrodynamic modeling, the runtime ratio, we're getting roughly about one and a half years per day of simulation time. So that's real time. We'll get one and a half years thereabouts um, with this detailed model. Now, if we want to use more long-term assessments, it's been really effective development and use of this rapid model that we have here. So you see below, we've got a larger cell size, um, but the, there's been quite a bit of development um, to try and resolve similar hydrodynamic features between the detailed and the rapid models without the computational expense. And we can see as a result, we're getting much larger runtime ratios. It's almost 60 times faster. And the rapid model has been developed um, with intent for optioneering screening and simulations greater than 10 years. But the intent of the model was to be able to resolve almost 100 years 
of simulation time within the space of a day of modeling time. Uh, that's so the computational expense is a lot less, but it allows us to really get through the optioneering screening a lot more efficiently and also look at long-term assessments such as climate change and so on. So with this, uh, we'll have a look at the some of the calibrations between the two, noting that the, the 100 year in one day um, was made possible really with the, the the dynamic morphology that we saw in previous slides too. So it's pretty amazing we can get a, a, a quite an efficient model turnover with such complex morphological processes also accommodated. Um, so on the left hand side we have water level um, at various locations through the lagoon. So in the top we're going from near the river, Murray River mouth and into the South Lagoon um, ultimately down here. And again observations are in orange and the model predictions are in, in blue here. And on the right we've got temperature similarly uh, moving south through the lagoon and we can see in both cases we're getting a really good prediction of the water levels um, and also the uh, the temperature as well. So we're getting the hydrodynamics uh, with a big tick and also the, hydro, uh, the thermodynamics um, are also being well resolved in this model. So that brings us on to um, further developments and applications and particularly in the way of salinity. So we know we've got the hydrodynamics, thermodynamics right, but what, does, what considerations do we need to look at when we're looking in the South Lagoon? Now, because of the hypersaline trends that we see in the Kurong, we're seeing seasonal fluctuations getting from around 50 grams per litre to up to 100 grams per litre in the South Lagoon. Um, and even extreme cases, um, we need to accommodate uh, salinities up to almost over 150 grams per litre. So with these salinity trends, we've also got to factor the a correction for vapour pressure. We know from Salatoro, we've got a, a figure here which shows the relationship in density, which is a function of increase. So uh, is a function of salinity. So with increasing salinity, we're getting increase in density. We also get a reduction in vapour pressure. So with that, we get reduced evaporation um, but we also get an increase in temperature in the water column too. So these factors have been accommodated into the new versions of the, the two flow of fee code so we can resolve these processes in a hypersaline environment more accurately. And another factor to consider is salt mass retention on dry cells. So conventionally, if a cell goes dry, the salt mass will be lost in the model. So if we wet that cell again, that salt mass won't be retained. Um, but what we've done, we've modified the code so that salt mass is retained on those dry cells. So it, more critically, if we hit those seasonal fluctuations in water level, the salt pans will um, resolve those the salt uh, that's retained on the salt pans and it'll regress into the model, which has been a really critical process in combination with the vapor pressure to try and get these salinity trends correct. So let's have a look at application of this. Um, on the left right hand side, we have a timeline, which is about a three year period. Um, and on the Y axis, we have salinity. And in orange, we have some observations of salinity. We can see the seasonal peaks ranging from 100 grams per litre down to around 50 grams per litre. And then in the, in the sorry, in the blue, we have the, the predicted salinities with the traditional or the standard salinity treatments. And we can see under prediction of salinity as we progress through the model in the order of up to 20 um, grams per litre. So these changes are pretty significant and we can't ignore these particularly for the assessment we want to look at here. So with the upgrades, um, the hypersaline hyper treatment upgrades, we're actually seeing really good agreement here in green with the orange um, observations. When we're picking up those peaks now, we're also seeing the troughs um, really well accommodated by the model. So yeah, with these changes have been quite critical in, in terms of predicting the hypersaline trends we see in the South Lagoon. So another cool feature we have here is water age. Um, and it's, it's quite a valuable tool in assessing the, the, the way that water quality can be assessed in the model. So water age in this case uh, is something we've been used to assess the, the movement of freshwater influxes and from or the tidal exchange and where um, into in throughout the lagoon. So you'll see what we've got here is a bird's eye view and we've got a line going from uh, along the extent of the, 
the Karong. And here we've got a cross section of, of the water age um, showing the, the depth and the water levels at the top of the water column and that water age throughout that transect. And what we can see with the freshwater inflows and the tidal, um, operation, uh, tidal processes, we're getting a lot newer or younger water um, mixing through the water column here and we're getting a lot older water um, sitting in the uh, south lagoon but we can see the the influence of the the confluence or the hydrodynamic control points being the uh, the pond canaros here um, where we can see that change in water level um, but also uh, it acts as a control point for trapping in the um, in the the older water uh, that we see here with this with a larger water age so really quite a useful tool in assessing the hydrodynamics and the mixing processes here um, that's been included in the two flare fee code. So another development that we've, we've also considered is the, the nature of evapor-concentrating traces. So conventionally, um, with the water, if, if we consider a tracer as a, a source that we can track the water movement through a model, it previously added a uh, function in almost like a, in the scalar sense of a salinity tracer. Um, so if, if we had an evaporation, the, the water would evaporate, but the tracer concentration would increase, um, which is much similar to what, with the analogy of salinity. If the water evaporates, the, the salinity also increases and retains in the model. So if we were to look at the mixing behavior and mixing dynamics of various traces through the model, let that be barrage inflows or tidal inflows, it's been a lot, it's been a lot more valuable to consider this as uh, to disable this vapor concentration behavior, where if the water evaporates, um, so too will that tracer concentration. So um, we get a better idea of the mass balance um, of various traces and how they interact. Um, throughout the model as a result of the hydrodynamics. And further, um, I'll briefly touch on the, the application of these models. Um, and that's one particularly interesting case is biogeochemical assessments we've been doing of late. So that's been a collaboration with the University of Western Australia, um, but we use, the, we use these models in, in combination with um, a whole bunch of uh, different if, uh, infrastructure implementations. Um, where we can look at the water quality and habitat impacts um, and the, with a role for decision-making of infrastructural implementations. So that's been pretty useful in terms of looking at the habitat of um, the seagrass called uh, Rupia tuberosa, which is quite a unique seagrass to this, um, to this setting. And it has a tendency to really like these saline conditions that we have in the South Lagoon. So we, here we have some sheet map plots of, of the Rupia tuberosa through different um, life cycle phases uh, where we have an adult flower and seeding phase. And we can see the spatial distributions, which are more conducive, which is in yellow um, and less conducive uh, in blue to uh, a particular infrastructure um, scenario relative to a baseline condition. So we can see improvement of um, the seeding um, phase of, of the Rupia tuberosa uh, life cycle, um, but also a reduction um, here in the North Lagoon. So really useful tool. Um, and it can be used for different, um, different habitats as well, uh, where we can uh, look at fish species and, and so on, and what environments might be more conducive to, to the flora and fauna. And that brings me to my summary, um, where modeling a shallow uh, hypersaline estuary can present some significant challenges. And these, these may include the morphological processes, the freshwater inflow dynamics, and extreme salinity uh, gradients that we see um, moving from the freshwater inflows uh, to, from the Murray River and, uh, and then moving into the South Lagoon. So with this, we've, we've come across some, um, some, some novel model developments and they've been to include the efficient morphological schematizations, particularly in the way of um, long-term modeling scenarios, uh, rapid model developments. Uh, so we can look at, again, the, the long-term scenarios and optioneering screening, hypersaline treatment. Um, so to correct the, the vapor pressures and the salt mass as a result, of the, the hypersaline uh, extremes that we see. And also added the functionality of water age um, and of tracer vapor concentration flags. So we have a bit more flexibility in terms of how we assess um, the, the movement of water um, and flushing dynamics in the Karong. 
And finally, that we've also briefly touched on application of these hydrodynamic models in decision making, particularly in way of biogeochemical modeling, water quality, environment, habitat modeling, with the use of optioneering and habitat assessment. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. I believe I'll be handing over to Zach um, to follow suit with his interesting helicoidal um, flows in three-dimensional three uh, riverine setting. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. My name is Zach Cooper and I'm a coastal and structural engineer from BMT. Uh, today I'll be talking to you about the use of uh, 3D hydrodynamic modeling to inform structural design. Uh, the focus will be a case study of a piled deck type structure located on the bend of the lower Brisbane River. Uh, essentially underneath this bridge you can see in the picture here. For those of you unfamiliar with Brisbane, the river is susceptible to flooding and there have been two significant floods in the last 12 years. The river wraps around the city and as you can see here, during flooding it interacts with a lot of riverside infrastructure. So I'll be focusing today on illustrating a couple of key use aspects of hydrodynamic modeling. Firstly, the embedment of a structural system within detailed hydrodynamic modeling, which is a relatively data rich structural design task, as opposed to a more traditional approach of nominating a peak flow velocity and applying this to the structure as a whole. Secondly, the difference between 2D and 3D hydrodynamic modeling in two flow FE in terms of the realized flow field in a complex flow area and the resulting consequences for structural design. I'll break down the presentation today into four segments. Firstly, some background to the modeling and project inputs to this case study. Uh, then we'll examine some of the hydrodynamic modeling results in the area of interest. Uh, we'll take a look at some structural design results and then discuss some of the outcomes. I've outlined in this flow chart some of the components of this study. So I've actually leveraged the hydrodynamic modeling results of two previous projects as indicated here in yellow. And from this uh, modeling have extracted the relevant information to describe the river dynamics. Subsequently, I've used this data to conduct some structural modeling of an example structure, and from this talk to some of the design outcomes. One of the key data sources I've used for this study is some of the work product of the Brisbane River Catchment Flood Study conducted by BMT. This is a very large piece of hydraulic engineering in its own right, and has been the subject of numerous presentations. Uh, I refer you here to the report uh, as indicated, which can be sourced from Queensland government websites. In simple terms, the study involved the development of a hydrodynamic modeling framework for a substantial portion of the Brisbane River with boundary conditions from a detailed hydrologic assessment. The framework involved the development of a fast model, which was used for a very large number of assessments and a more detailed model, which was used to model a key subset of 60 events corresponding to annual exceedance probabilities or AEPs ranging up to one in 2000. The models were calibrated to five historical flood events and extensively reviewed as part of the project. For context, uh, the Brisbane River catchment is located towards the south of Queensland on the East Australian coastline. Now, the extent of the detailed model uh, indicated here. So the model consisted of a 2D depth average hydrodynamic model developed in two flow classic with 1D components included as required for hydraulic features. You can see here that the model covers the lower populous uh, flood prone reaches of the Brisbane River and extends out to the sea boundary. Now, in a subsequent project to support various riverine structural design tasks in the central Brisbane region, BMT developed a series of even more detailed 3D hydrodynamic models in two flow FE. One of the models, which I've indicated here, provides coverage of the central city region, including the Story Bridge, um, which I referred to in that photo earlier. These models use the results of the detailed modeling from the Brisbane River catchment flood study to provide upstream and downstream boundary conditions for the representative design flood events. The results of the 3D model were further calibrated to match the validated 2D model at three tide gauge locations. 
The 3D models were then used to simulate around 30 design events ranging from 1 in 50 AEP to 1 in 2000 AEP, and the results provided uh, for use in design tasks. Uh, we'll now move on to discuss some of these 3D modeling results in a little more detail. For this study, I focused on this one region of the model, a hairpin river bend located to the north of Kangaroo Point. Reasons why I've selected this location, it is a hairpin bend generating some hydrodynamic complexities. It, uh, it is a point of flow constriction with some high current speeds. Um, an extensive amount of development has been completed on the north bank of this location. Um, and it can be expected that the river dynamics would include secondary flows and thus strong 3D flow effects of this region. So what are secondary flows? Um, in the coordinate system of the river, primary flows are aligned with the notional flow direction of the river as a whole, while secondary flows are in the cross-sectional plane to which the primary river flows are oriented at 90 degrees. Within the cross-section, these flows are circular by nature due to the constraints of the cross-section. Due to the primary flow component, the overall flow is then described as helicoidal, as in they flow in a corkscrew helix pattern around the bend of the river. This flow pattern is also associated with super elevation of the outer bend as momentum forces of water pile up on the outer edge. At this location, the super elevation during the one in 2000 AEP event, as in the elevation difference across the width of the river was of the order 0.9 meters. Now, just to illustrate some of the dangers of this area, I have some footage from the flood in January this year, focusing on the location of the ferry terminal as indicated by the pink dot. So here you can see a houseboat, which has come free of its moorings, uh, drifting down the river and impacting the ferry terminal and then rather rapidly capsizing. There was actually someone on board this houseboat at the time and amazingly they floated to the next pontoon where they were rescued amidst piles of debris. So to add to why I've selected this location, it is a clear focus point for dangers in the river with high flow volumes, a strong 3D flow regime substantial quantities of debris and a large amount of development in the area. For this presentation, I've chosen to focus on the most extreme event simulated, um, a one in 2000 AEP event. The results are displayed here using the TubeFlow viewer plugin to QGIS. At the top of the screen is a spatial plot of the current velocity magnitude, including current vectors. And then at the bottom of the screen is a contour plot of primary current magnitude overlaid by a vector plot of the secondary currents within the nominated cross section. As we click forward in time, you can see the development of the peak flood current and note that the extent of the flooding spreads to cover the south bank. Some of the 3D flow effects also become obvious here. In the cross section, you can see that super elevation of the flow on the outside of the bend corresponding to the left side of the cross section. You can also see that helicoidal circulation in the cross-section vector field. Now to drill down further into the secondary flow behaviors, I've extracted some of the results for the one in 2000 AEP event for the point during the simulation with peak water levels at the river bend. So on the left, we have some spatial plots of the current velocity magnitude, as well as arrows to indicate the horizontal velocity vector for three different elevations at the surface, mid depth and at the bed. Key features of the flow here include the thick and deep flow band of high current velocities central to the river. But also if you scan from top to bottom, one can observe rotation of the velocity vectors from the surface to the bed levels. And near the pink line where I've taken the cross section, this rotation may be as high as 45 degrees. The figure on the right indicates the pink cross section of velocity, both normal to the cross section as in the primary current and in the plane of the cross section, which I've labeled lateral velocity and is in effect the secondary current. In the bottom planar plot, I've indicated the velocity vectors within this plane. So this includes the vertical velocities. 
These results clearly indicate the presence of helicoidal flow in the formation of the corkscrew flow pattern and its structure within the river. So this is a good point to briefly discuss the assumptions underlying the 3D modeling capability of two-flow FE. This model is a layered 3D model that makes a hydrostatic assumption with vertical velocities recovered from the conservation of mass equations. Computational fluid dynamics or CFD differs in that it allows vertical accelerations and involves solution of the Navier-Stokes equations in 3D. 2D models, on the other hand, involve a single layer in which the solution terms are averaged throughout the entire depth of the water column. The 3D results thus provide a much greater level of detail about the flow structure, which is appropriate when the vertical velocities remain relatively small compared to the horizontal velocities. The results are then appropriate to this setting and involve much less computational effort than CFD modeling. So CFD modeling is fairly intractable in this setting due to the need to transition from the dimensional scale of the river to representing multiple piles. Uh, additionally, it would not be possible to run the model for the duration of a flood event as I have in this case. Um, and finally, it is not clear that the CFD modeling would add much value in this setting over what can be provided by the 3D nonlinear shallow water equations. To further illustrate the flow field in this area, I've extracted the results at the point indicated uh, for the full simulation. So I've plotted the current velocities over the depth of the water column in the X and Y directions as indicated. So X being downriver and Y being cross river. I've plotted these results for the full time series of the simulation in gray, illustrating the development of higher water levels and velocities. The results also indicate the degree of flow overturning occurring with lateral velocity in opposite directions at the top and bottom of the water column. It's easy enough to see that if the results are averaged over the depth, the presence of flow in the opposite direction at the base of the water column means that if one were to try to reconstruct the typical logarithmic flow profile from the depth average value, then the peak magnitude would be missed as well as it's the true distribution of flow structure. Uh, it's worth noting further that the peak velocity and the peak water level do not coincide, though they're not separated in time substantially. So these results illustrate the substantial departures from a 2D depth averaged logarithmic flow profile that can be produced in complex areas of the river. Essentially with a 2D model, you miss capturing these flow complexities, which is not problematic for large scale modeling tasks, but for highly localized tasks, the 3D flows may be quite important. Uh, now to help further illustrate these flow patterns, I've processed the results to illustrate the flow around the bend. Um, now the water surface is plotted here as a translucent surface so that you can peer into the mechanics of the river. Then in the center of the river, the solid surface indicates the region of the river that is flowing its uh, current speeds greater than four meters a second. Around the perimeter of the cross section, as I've indicated on the upstream face, I've initiated streamlines to track through to the downstream location. The streamlines basically indicate the trajectory of a particle of fluid traveling from the point of initiation through the system. So in this slide, I've created an animation which rotates that graphic 360 degrees. So this allows the viewer to understand the path of those streamlines a bit more effectively. So as the figure rotates, you can observe on the outer bank, the streamlines that commence near the surface dive back underneath to the bottom of the river. Conversely, the streamlines that commence near the bottom of the river corkscrew up the inner face of the bend to the, uh, to the, inner, um, to the inner side of the bend. Meanwhile, the region of high flow velocity, as in the solid region, narrows horizontally and becomes deeper, reflecting the influence of the returning flows from the north bank. It should be clear then that the 3D behaviors of the river are substantial and it is not difficult to see how they may be influential to design considerations of structures located within this flow. This next section will look at the behavior of an example structure located within this flow region.
So in order to examine the consequence of applying these detailed hydrodynamics to a structure for design purposes, I've developed an example structure consisting of a gridded deck overlying vertical and raking piles. Such a structure is typical near shore with the key structural features in the horizontal plane being the deck behaves like a rigid diaphragm while lateral loads are supported predominantly by transversely and longitudinally oriented raking piles with assistance from the remaining nest of piles. So raking piles are piles that are installed at an angle to the vertical and due to this angle are much stiffer in the horizontal directions than vertical piles and consequently tend to attract a much greater proportion of any horizontal loads such as current loads. You can see here I've positioned the example structure on the north bank of the river in depths I'd consider typical for the area. For the analysis, I've used the two flow FE modeling results to apply loads to the network of piles for the full time series of the hydrodynamic model. Loads are applied in 3D using the Morrison equation. The structure itself has been analyzed under the quasi-static assumption using software developed in-house. Uh, I've also analyzed the structure using results from the 2D analysis, analysis so that they can be compared with the 3D results. So let's take a look at some of the 3D results. So I've made this animation which shows the concurrent river flow profile on three cross-sectional slices and the de deformation of the deck structure over the duration of the flood event. The color bar on the left indicates the magnitude of the current while the color bar on the right indicates the magnitude of the structural displacement. So it is evident the structural deflections are maximized somewhere close to the point in time of maximum water level and current. One can also observe there's some variation in the intensity of the helicoidal flow when comparing the cross sections up at the upstream and downstream sides of the structure. At the upstream side, the secondary currents are mainly oriented towards the northern bank, while at the downstream side, the flow is more clearly helicoidal with a large flow returning to the south deeper in the water column. The wobble that you can see in the structural deflections around the peak of the flood event points to the fact that the distribution of loads throughout the structure is complex and may not necessarily be maximized for each individual structural member at the same time. So as a designer, uh, I want to understand the implications of the dif difference between 2D and 3D in terms of the impact on my design decision-making. So the, there are a number of factors which contribute to the number of design decisions that are made for a structure. Uh, but as a proxy, I've used the peak design forces in each structural element, which is a natural way to think about it. Uh, these are referred to as design actions for example, the peak axial load in a pile is a design action, which I've labeled as N. And so is the peak moment in a pile, which I've labeled as M. We also have moments about two axes, which I've labeled M1 and M2. In order to understand the impact of moving from 2D to 3D hydrodynamics on the structural behavior, I've focused on two ways of describing this impact. The first is the percentage change in the peak magnitude of these actions for the most severely loaded member, as very often a large number of members will be selected based on the most severely loaded member. The second is the distribution of percentage change in individual members, which I'll discuss in the next slide. For results presentation, I've chosen to focus on the piles for which I've collated the results. <clears throat> So the table to the top left indicates the maximum percentage increase in axial force or biaxial moment within any of the piles for the 3D case versus the 2D case. The results vary from 10% to 50% depending on the type of pile and the design action. The figure at the bottom groups the results for all vertical piles and constructs an envelope around them. So orange for 3D results and blue for 2D results. Again, it is evident that the 3D results increase the severity of the design actions throughout the structure, which can be seen as the 3D result envelope lies outside the 2D result envelope. In terms of the distribution of these design action increases throughout the structure, the plot on the right provides histograms for each pile type and each type of action, uh, as in N equals axial force, M equals moment. 
uh, where the color of the bar indicates the percentage change in that design action for that member group. And the height of the bar indicates the percentage of the total design evaluations that are adjusted by that value. For example, I've highlight, highlighted the category of lateral raking piles, that is piles that control deflection of the structure towards the riverbank um, for the axial force design action labeled in. To make this easier to understand, the orange bars indicate the proportion of the design evaluations that change by less than 5%. For most of the groups, this varies between 60 and 85%, but for the lateral rakers, which control deflections of the structure towards the riverbank, only 40% of design evaluations are relatively unchanged, meaning over 60% of the design evaluations are increased by more than 5%, and for about 8% uh, of design evaluations, th this increases over 25%. These results then indicate that one must be quite careful about applying the results of 2D hydrodynamic modeling for structural design, and some further allowance should be made for the full complexity of the flow field. At the very least, the potential for helicoidal flow should be quantified and adjustments made to the current distribution as required by the structural form and design rationale. To conclude, the main points of the presentation are that uh, the 3D modeling highlights uh, helicoidal overturning and other flow phenomena that may be important to dependent engineering applications. Uh, secondly, the current field can vary considerably from 2D flow over the scale of embedded structures. And it's also worth noting that peak water levels and currents are not necessarily coincident. Uh, in terms of consequences for structural analysis and design, representing the 3D current fields as 2D flow can be variously conservative or unconservative for structural design evaluations uh, in structures of a similar size to the flow complexity. So that concludes my presentation. Um, so over to you, Katrina. Thank you very much, Zach, and thank you also to Mitchell um, for your two very different presentations. It's really extremely useful for us to see how we can use these hydrodynamic modelling tools to better understand these really complex systems and to use that information to inform really good decision making. There's been some really great questions coming in, and I'd like to invite um, Mitchell and Zach and also Mitch Smith to join us so we can discuss some of the more popular questions that have been submitted. I'll hand over to you, Mitch. Thanks very much for that, Katrina, and yeah, thanks for the presentations. Uh, also, thank you all for your awesome questions that have been coming through. Um, I've got a few good ones here. I might start with, uh, with Zach. Um, one of the questions that came through was regarding um, whether any cell size sensitivity had been done uh, looking, I guess that's both horizontal and vertical uh, cell size uh, sensitivity testing being done and were um, the cell size uh, models run, were they independent? You know, did you get similar results? Uh, yes, I believe a convergence study uh, on the discretization was conducted as um, part of the development of these models. Um, I, I can't speak to that directly, um, but the uh, basis would have been the 2D model uh, would have started with that discretization uh, and then trialed a couple of finer meshes until the results were seen to converge. Thanks for that one, Zach. Um... There's another question that's come through, and I think you answered one of them quite well about the use of this uh, nonlinear shallow water equation model versus a CFD model for the application. The, the follow-up question here is that the, the cell sizes that have been used um, in two-flow FV look to be quite coarse compared to the structure that's assessed. And so what's your feeling or um, idea about you know, finer eddies that may be occurring within those cells and how they might be affecting uh, shear stresses and velocities on, on the piles. Yeah, so there's no doubt um, the formation of finer eddies or, or features that are on a subgrid scale um, 
and some allowance for that would have to be made by the designer. So I think if you were to apply um, this modeling for design purposes, then that would be, um, I guess, the onus would then be on the designer to make extra allowances to deal with subgrid scale um, behaviors. Okay, thank you for that. Feel free to send through some additional questions as well there if you have them and we can also answer those. Um, Mitchell Baum, we had a couple of questions regarding the Kurong. One was the, you know, what, what sort of size uh, is, is the model in terms of the length and uh, rough area? Uh, and is it pretty flat kind of area was, was one question. Yeah, yeah. So to resolve the Kurong, we, we've got the full length of it resolved. Um, so yeah, it's, it's about 120 kilometers in length. Um, and then getting down to cell sizes, for the most part, they're in the order of 100 to 200 meters in the detailed model. Um, but then we get to resolving the, um, the channels, uh, which is a main feature that we try to stamp in on the model uh, to, to resolve the hydro, hydraulic connectivity throughout the Krong. So that's getting down to yeah, cell sizes in the order of uh, yeah, 10 to 20 meters, I believe. Um, so yeah, it, given with the flexible mesh that we have with two flow FV, we've, we've got quite large cell size gradients, but the key features are primarily resolved uh, with that intent to try and capture the hydrodynamic processes. Thanks for that, Mitch. I hope I didn't miss something when I was typing away there. But uh, the other question was, uh, this modeling, has it been done in, in 2D only or is it being done in 3D or are there plans to look at 3D effects and uh, mm. what's the, the value of having a 3D model? Yeah, yeah. So the modeling of presented today is really been in 2D. Um, so given it's, uh, it's shallow um, setting, it's around two meters depth. Um, yeah, it, it is quite a well mixed. Uh, we can use the assumption that it's quite well mixed. Um, but they're not saying there that there are some interesting mechanisms that could occur with uh, given the hypersaline gradients. So uh, we're, we're dealing with salinities mixing through from fresh water through to the hypersaline gradients that we see in the South Karong. So yeah, 3D dynamics would be quite an interesting feature to resolve. Um, yeah, given given the, the nature of the work we've done so far, a lot of it's been looking at different scenarios and uh, infrastructure implementations. We haven't been able to drill down too into too much detail in 3D um, model um, scenario runs, but uh, yeah, if we dial down on a scenario we need to look at into more detail, that'll be an interesting dynamic. And it's something we tweaked around with a little bit, um, but yeah, it's something to look into further should it come up. Thanks for that, Mitch. Uh, I had a question from Mohammed that I can answer. So. Yeah, so the, the question was, can the model be used to represent spatially varying flow velocity and super elevation around the, the bend in the river? The, the model results that Zach showed do have that super elevation. Um, and you can see, see that if you watch the, um, the replay on YouTube later of the outer bend, you'll see the, the elevation of the water go up. And that, that's a fundamental driver of this uh, helicoidal um, you know, flow behavior that you see as the um, as the terms try to equal themselves out as they go around the bend. So it's so absolutely, that's what these models are designed for, to have that, that spatial variation. So um, very good. Um, so I think we're getting to the end of the questions, um, unless there was any, any other um, questions at the last minute you wanted to throw, throw in there. We'll also get your questions and uh, you know, add some additional answers there if we have, have missed you. Um, so I think, I think that's it, unless anyone has any final buzzer questions uh, there. Um, the thank, one thank question, you. oh, so I'll just quickly, sorry. Um, yeah, so Two-Flow FV, the one that both of the guys have been presenting today can be run in either 2D or 3D mode. Um, and Two-Flow Classic or Two-Flow HPC is, is a 2D only model and it's really geared up for um, urban urban modeling and flooding, um, but they can all be, you know, all the Two-Flow uh, engines can be used um, for coastal and uh, flooding purposes. So thanks, Katrina. No worries. Thanks, Mitch. Look, I'm, I'm conscious of time. So look, a very big thank you from, um, from me to Mitch Smith, 
Mitch Baum and Zach Cooper for the time and effort that uh, you've put into preparing these presentations. I know I found them really interesting and I hope that, um, that all of our audience has too. A few housekeeping things before we finish. A link to this recording will be emailed to you if you registered and this recording will also be available on the AWS website and via their YouTube channel. You'll also be emailed an attendance certificate within two business days, which you can use for your CPD records. I'd also like to ask you to complete the short survey that will pop up at the end of this webinar. And your feedback is really important because your responses help AWS to host the types of presentations that you are most interested in. There are also several AWS webinars and training courses coming up. If any of these, including two flow training, are of interest to you, please make sure you register or check them out. In conclusion, thank you everyone for your attendance today. I hope you found it worthwhile and we hope to see you again next time. Thank you and goodbye. Thanks for watching. Subscribe by clicking the link below and click on the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases. For the latest in significant, innovative and critical advances in water science, technology and management, subscribe now to build your skills, enhance your technical knowledge and learn from leading experts in water, visit the australianwaterschool.com.au and discover our online training courses, both live and on demand.